Hello, I'm Robert D. Kaplan, Chief Geopolitical Analyst for Stratfor, a private global intelligence firm. And with me today is Matt Gertgen, uh, one of our chief analysts who specializes in Asia. And what we are going to be discussing today is why East Asia attracts less passion from journalists and intellectuals than Europe, Africa, and the Middle East do. Matt, um, why don't you take it from here? I mean, I think one issue here is language and civilization. Uh, mm. The United States did not develop out of East Asian civilization. We don't have the inherent kind of uh, uh, intellectual background that comes from that. So whereas journalists are always interested in Europe, and there's you know famous uh, Americans who were journalists like uh, Ernest Hemingway or something who went to Europe and took part in European history, those types of people don't tend to be as common uh, with East Asia. And there's the other factor you pointed out in your article, which is that Asia is all about business. I mean, when you talk about intellectuals in Asia, or if you just Google it, it'll come up with intellectual property, which is, you know, a legal concern. And, right. Yes. And you're going to have a lot of, of, of that going on where essentially uh, slow, strategic, uh, long game uh, chess type manu maneuvers yes. uh, that don't grab a lot of headlines. The unfamiliar of the languages and ethnicities makes it a little bit harder for people to connect with the human concerns like refugees. So those issues are uh, not very compelling to the American audiences, um, at least not on the par with, with Europe or the Middle East. Yes, you make a good point. Look at, you have, you have Chinese hegemonic aggression of sorts in East Asia, and you have Russian hegemonic aggression of sorts in Europe. But the Russian kind is rude. It's, you know, it's with special forces, people with, you know, with black ski masks, etc. Um, it's, you know, it's much more visceral. You know, it's, it's like an old war movie. Whereas China's aggression is it occurs at sea, out of, out of sight, out of mind. It's very gradual. China's goal is how to, how to seek dominance without ever having to fight anybody, without ever having to fight the United States. It's, mu it's much more abstract almost. And it doesn't, it doesn't um, um, fit within the parameters of a news story because it's a long range trend. Whereas Russia does things that are aggressive and dramatic by, good, by annexing Crimea, mm -hmm. supporting pro-Russian groups, Groups in Ukraine, whereas China, it's almost elegant, using coast guards to uh, a coast guard ship to intimidate the Filipino Navy on on bare rocks in the middle of the sea where there are no television cameras whatsoever. So it's like writing about Asia is more of a challenge than writing about Central Eastern Europe, for example. Well, there's something interesting there, too, which you've really hit on, is that the Chinese in the region are perceived as being much more brazen than many of the other countries. So contrast the Japanese, who, for instance, they expanded their air defense identification zone to cover uh, areas mm. that they bicker with Taiwan about. Uh, and and also offended China in doing that. But that was not a big global controversy when the Japanese did it. Only when the Chinese did it did everyone kind of gather attention to it. So it's interesting because while you're correct, the Chinese use different layers of authority. Yes. They use different types of authority yeah. to kind of um, uh, defer or delay any kind of um, comeuppance. The Japanese are actually involved in, in many of their own games, uh, big maneuvers, uh, to try to shore up what, what is the status quo and what they view, view as like a, a, a kind of a crumbling situation for them in the East China Sea and even in the North in, involving Russia. So um, th there's a lot of subtleties in... And Subtlety is the word. Yeah. That's what defines East Asia. And subtleties make less dramatic headlines than the, ki than the kind of blood-curdling sectarian wars we see in Syria, in Iraq, mm -hmm. or the tribal violence in the Central Afri African Republic in South Sudan, or even the takeover of buildings by a regular sinister-looking paramilitary forces um, in, um, in the eastern part of Ukraine. In addition to subtlety, there has been a values debate in Asia, but it's not dramatic. It's not like between liberalism and uh, an ethnic cleansing. It's not between like an evil dictator like Slobodan Milosevic in Yugoslavia and the values of the Western, you know, liberalized values of the European Union. In Asia, the big victor in the values debate has not been good or evil 
soul, but this gray shade of pragmatism, mm. of uh, you know, of substituting the beauty of ideas for what works. Like Doug Chopin. Right. So, like the hero in Central Europe since the fall of the Berlin Wall, you could say was the former Czech leader Václav Havel, mm -hmm. who is a you know Nobel Prize uh, uh, um, you know level person. Whereas the hero in Asia is Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, the founder of the modern state of Singapore, who's more like a corporate business leader than he totally. is like an inspiring liberal politician. Mm, yeah, I, I think that's right. You know, the other element is the way that America especially perceives the region. Uh, you know, Europe in the early 20th century had a lot of interest in East Asia and in the ideological battles that were going on. A lot of that had to do with the disillusionment with colonialism on the European side. Yeah. And then going to places like Burma, like George Orwell, or or, um, or Anthony Burgess in Malaysia. Yeah. And these are people who were actually concerned with the fate of the peoples who they found themselves awkwardly in the position of ruling over. Um, and then simultaneously, uh, you know, in, in Asia itself, you had an awakening against the European powers. And that did create a lot of, of kind of intellectual output and a lot of uh, good yeah. writing and journalism as well. But, uh, you know, with the Americans... That, that was decades ago, though. It, it, it was the first half of the 20th yeah. century. And, right. and Americans are very different. Uh, for one, our intellectuals, I think, tend to be underdogs or to view themselves as underdogs. And you can go to Europe and stage a big critique of the American system. Yes. And you look sophisticated. But if you go to Asia to stage a critique of a capitalist system, you're a little bit of a fish out of water. Right. Because Asia is all about business. Mm. It, you know, these are prosperous, postmodern, te highly technological societies ruled by pragmatism. Not a lot to engage intellectuals. Uh, anyway, a lot more to think about. It's been a pleasure to be here. I'm Robert D. Kaplan from Stratfor, and here is uh, Matt Gherkin, and we thank you for listening. Thanks a lot.